welcome to the Western Peak Podcast. I am your host, Mikhail Naha, and I am here today with two of my friends. Please introduce yourself. I am Sal James. And my name is Kenny Sloan, and this is episode one of The Gambler, brought to you by Gray Streak Studios. So, there's a similarity between one a Navajo story from your guys' side and a Hopi story of the gambler. Would you like to start it off? Mm-hmm. All right. So, um, so hey, Kenny Sonny, I don't know. Shining in the Hobani National, don't know how to talk in a country, but she's changed the country to just trade us. It's not during the national. Uh, do a ton of late and Nasha, a good day got the next national. So, my name is Kenny Sloan. I'm from the Gray Street people, um, the Hobani, and I'm from Tonali, Arizona. And my upbringing was I was both raised in a traditional and Native American church household. And for those of you who don't know out there, that Native American church was is the peyote religion that's often called. While the traditional side of my family is mainly like the traditional Navajo uh, belief system. So that's like Hajonja, Hachonja, all those ceremonies and all that stuff. And so, um, but yeah, that's my background. And um, there is this story that was always told to me growing up. You know, there's a lot of stories told in the creation stories and the histories and origins of our people. And one of them that always comes up is the story of the gambler. So the gambler in Navajo way is called Nahui Pichni. And, you know, we were, um, as I said, there's, there's actually a common figure that exists in the, in the Hopi culture and the stories and all that stuff. And then, um, Sahel, do you, like, want to introduce yourself and tell about how your upbringing was, too? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone. Sahel James in the uh, hello everyone, my name is Sahel James. I am from the or I am from the Red House People clan and also born born for Deer Springs people. And I am from Windrock, Arizona. <clears throat> and from my upbringing, I was way, raised to the fireplace, so both from the um, NAC Native American Church. And also through the traditional side too, with the hojoj or hojoj, as Kenny mentioned. And yes, I do have some knowledge with the gambler or nahui bichni, as I firmly know it as. I am Mikel Naha. I am from the Hopi tribe. And my version of introducing myself is Nuktima Hopi Matsuwa, Nuktima Bifumwa which just roughly translates to, I am Walking Bear, I am Hopi, I am from the village of Masangnavi, and I am Tobacco. And the, I was introduced to the story through a book that was written down by a, a Hopi person in which the gambler is in another world above us. Yeah, so I think we were talking, we kind of came across this subject, just talking about stories and all that. But I'll start with um, the Navajo rendition, as I was told by my great grand, my grandparents. And I think before we start this, there's a little disclaimer because these are oral histories, and sometimes they can conflict or they can talk badly about other people's ancestors. And I'll just be saying it how I did, but I think in that regard too, you know, this is why we're here today to kind of discover the differences between these different things. So the way Shache used to say was that it all starts at chuckle. Chaco Bahano, the Chaco is Katanjin. So Chaco Canyon, it is called today. Chaco Canyon, according to the scientists and um, American researchers, was this grand um, civilization that existed roughly a um, thousand years ago, wasn't it? Because it, was, it flourished between the um, 1100s and 1300s, located in um, northern New Mexico. And there's many theories and stories about that, none are really postulated. But in the Navajo way, we always believed that that place was kind of like an evil place for us. We called it in Navajo, the name that actually comes from a Navajo word, which is Chaco. Chaco to Chaco. And Chaco means the place of crying or where one goes to cry. Because in our stories, we believe that the Anal Saze, or the people of our old ancient, the ancient ones that are lived there, there were, um, we believe that a lot of atrocities took place there and all that stuff to our people. And mainly that amongst the Navajo, we recognize that the Ana Saza, specifically the ones at Chaco, there were the ones who um who, who enslaved us and subjected us to a lot of um, humiliation and grief. And this kind of con- contradict with some Pueblo and Hopi histories who venerate and honor their ancestors 
because like some some villages do claim descendancy from Chaco. But we also believe in like the Anasazit of the cliff dwellings, the ones that are found in um near the Naval National Monument and other places. Like um what was that place called? Clap Castle, Sky Castle? I forgot. But that place mainly is like a place where a lot of uh, clans come from. Especially those like oh uh, like Sedishni comes from that I believe. The people of the around the rock because they come from where the rock crevices and all that stuff where they used to live a long time ago. And um but the main reason we say why there was crying at Chaco, why there was all this pain, was because of a figure they call Nahui Bishni. So Nahui Bishni means like the one who gambles. And so in Native American culture, gambling has a very big, uh, it was a very big thing back then. For the longest time, we, either, you know, archaeologists have discovered dice and and all that, and, and coins that are used, to like like, like uh, flipping coins and all that stuff to use that during, um, for games and all that, of chance and betting and was involved. And so they say a long time ago, in the time of those, when the Nasazas still lived around and when the Navajo first came up into the world and the, the deities were still around too, they said Nakwebishni used to challenge Navajos. So Navajos would come to him and he would challenge them. He would say, um, we're going to play this game. I'm going to roll these dice. If I win, I'll get this from you. And if you win, you'll get this from me. So it's usually money, like, but not money in the sense of the Western sense, but like um, livestock, uh Trading, precious, basically. yeah, trading, babies like precious jewels and all that, precious stones we mainly use. And so it got to a point where a lot of the Navajo started betting with Nahui Bitli, but Nahui Bitli would never lose, he would always win. And so a lot of Navajo became so desperate to win back their belongings because they would even bet away their family members in an attempt just to win back more of the riches that they lost. And it got to the point where a lot of Navajo offered themselves up. They're like, okay, I offer my my body, my, my personhood to you in exchange for a bet, and they would lose, and it would become his slaves. Eventually, Nakwe Bidley got a majority of the Navajo underneath his uh, contracts of gambling, and he started, that's what we say Nakwe Bidley was this god, not like a god in the Western sense, but a deity, a holy spirit, someone who powers, and he started um, building the city of Chaco with the with the slaves, and not only Navajos we recognize in our stories, but that of other tribes. We always say that other tribes were there. Even We even say that the Pueblo and Hopi were enslaved there too. Under this deity called Nakui Bikini. The way Nakui Bikini is described is very different, but we always say he's like this, like, uh, he has a lot of, he, he looks different to uh, the um, other um, people up here. And the main thing that I always, I always told is like he has long feathers, like, like in, his, in his hair, in his, um, on his head, like kind of like similar to the ones they find at Chaco, the Quetzal feathers that, that come from, um, New Me from Mexico, Mexico. In the Mexican Valley and all that, from places like Tenochtitlan and Texacoco of that of the former Aztec Empire, and so we say that um, eventually a boy um, wanted an Navajo boy called upon the deities. The deities met together because they said this was causing a lot of chaos and disorder in the world, and they wanted to free the freedom Navajo. And so the boy, with the power of Chahie, darkness, and the power of Nechche, the holy wind, he was able to uh, beat Nasquipichni through a lot of series of tests. Finding out that Nakwe Bithni was cheating the whole time. And at the end of the story, the gods got together, the holy people, the Yid and the and they got an arrow and they put Nakwe Bithni on, on it. And they pointed it towards the heavens and they shot him to the stars. So that way he'll never um, he'll never uh, come back again. At the end of the story, before Nakwe Bithni got shot into the stars, though, he said, I'll come back and I'm going to be winning back the people through. I'll, I'll win you back under so you can be under my, 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 my ownership and my slavery. And so a lot of Navajo people believe that these uh, things today like um, drugs and alcohol and Western like Westernization and all that stuff were, are actually Nakwe Bikini, his spirit, still trying to win us back and make us slaves to him. A lot of people say you become a slave to the bottle or a slave to the drug. And some say that, you know, that's Nakwe Bikini. They're trying to win you, win you back in that gambling sense. And so that's the kind of the story. And that's like, uh, I, I really had to condense and bare bones it because it's a really long story and all that stuff, but it kind of comes down to this idea that there's this figure that appeared that Chaco that had characteristics of um, Mexican um, Native Americans and all that stuff, like the Quetzal feathers and all that stuff. And I do believe that um, the science, like the science that Americans found that there was a big Aztec influence, a Mexica influence on the ruins at Chaco, you know, and then there's even evidence of human cannibalism and human sacrifice taking place there in the later stages of that society's existence. 
And I always, personally, this is just my own personal take. I always believed that um, eventually when this Mexica influence was put upon the people, the um, people at Chaco kind of turned away from the good path in the way. That's kind of what I, my grandparents always told me growing up, where that the people at Chaco were building a real good civilization, you know, one that was really powerful farming, had massive cities and had massive dances that had trading networks all across the country, all across the continent, my bad. And, um, but it turned away from it, from a good way of life, a, a peaceful, harmonious way. And so the Navajo, along with other tribes, all rose up to uh, cast the bonds of that. That's what we say what truly happened at Chaco. Even though a lot of like people say it was aliens or it was all that, uh, you know, it was like, that's not what happened. But that's just what's been said. That's probably what happened. So nothing like that. But I think that was the main thing we were talking about. I was telling this story to, to Mikhail and Sahel, and we found out that this um, figure of Nakwipitni shares characteristics with that found in the Hopi story. So you should talk about that now. I'll talk about that in a bit. Do you have anything to add to that, Sahel? No, just pretty much everything else was spot on too. Because with Nakwe he's he's the he's if the name translates to the one who gambles. And of course, as Kenny mentioned, that a lot of he he's he's been as soon as he um as you as soon as he knew what the power that he had, he was had that confidence to where like, he was able to bet against anyone. And a long time ago, again, he bet against a lot of the Navajo people and some of our deities too, or like some of the animals for their for their homeland, their habitats too. That's why he was able to gain some certain parts, gain access to parts of Chaco Canyon. And it got to a point where he, he was able to obtain a majority of it. Even um, one of our great deities too, the son, Johanna, eh? he was he was bold enough to bet against him, to challenge him. Because he's also one of our great deities too, one of the our, one of the great great warriors that in that time too, and so for um, for the son Johanna, eh, he was the one that that was that took the challenge too, because he was confident enough to bet against him, and unfortunately too, he bet against one of his precious items too, one of his. And one of his items that he held in his in his possession was a turquoise horse necklace, and that's what he used to bet against Nahui Bithli. And for that, if Nahui Bithli were to lose, he would give back all the items, all of the items, and um, free all of the Navajo people too that he had under his contracts. But unfortunately, that's when Johanna Air found out on how Nahui Bithli was. Was was winning all these different all these different bets all these different gambling sessions, that how he was able to get all these con all of the Navajo people the animals and all these items under contract, he found a way in how he was cheating, and so that's so he made that sacrifice to sacrifice one of his most precious possessions in order to gain the knowledge and what he knew on how to how to beat Nahui Bitli. And just to share a little bit on my part too, and also we'll go to Mikhail for your your side of the story too. From when it comes to the Hobie story of this, it was written in a book that I found when I was in high school and here on campus too, which is the People of the Short Blue Corn. It is different Hopi stories combined together that were taken from a Hopi elder when he told these stories and roughly translated to English. But this story follows a um young boy who lived out of one of the villages on the edge and he had two eagles with him one of them got into his uh, sister's um, corn mush and she killed it on accident she didn't mean to but she went and buried the eagle's body somewhere the boy came back when that same day from the fields and saw that the eagle was gone and his sister told him about what happened so the boy went over to where the eagle was buried at when that happened, the boy saw the eagle was huge. It was still alive. He was big. The eagle told him what happened, and he forgives what his sister had done because it was on accident. The boy talked to his eagle for a while, and I forgot what they were saying, but it was in, it's in the book. But the boy ended up climbing on the eagle's back, and he the eagle started flying higher and higher, going in circles. And when the boy looked down at the ground, he saw it just disappearing. And they came up to a hole in the, at the top of the sky. 
and the boy climbed through and there was another place where there was mountains, rivers, streams, animals running everywhere. And when the boy climbed out, he met Spider Grandmother. When he emerged from the hole, she stated, uh, she said that he can stay with her as long as he doesn't go to the north, which was the only rule that she had. And the boy prospered in this world. He went hunting. He did everything that he can to help out. And, Sp and Spider Grandmother took care of him with feeding him, telling him different stories and such. But one day, when the boy was hunting, he couldn't find any animals to hunt, so he thought of going north where the antelope were at. So when he went there, he came across the, uh, the gambler's house, and the gambler invited him inside. So he went in, and they talked for a bit about what they've been doing in the world and everything. And the gambler asked him if he wanted to play a couple of games with him, and the boy said yes. So they played a couple of friendly games, nothing too serious, until they started making bets. Then the boy bet off his clothes, his jewelry, his bow and arrow. And the last thing that he bet off was his life. Because the gambler asked him was that he can get all of his stuff back if he bets his own life. So the boy said yes. And when they started playing the game, the boy ended up losing at the end. And the gambler told him that. He, uh, he's going to claim his prize now. And he took the boy to a door and opened it up. And every er, all the cold from every single direction came all at once on the boy. And he started freezing and slowly dying away from it. And during this time, the spider grandmother was back at her home worried about him since he has not returned yet. So she, the only thing that, she, that came in her mind was he could be at the gambler's place. So that's where she went to. And she got there just in time before he died, and she made a bet with the gambler, or a an offer with the gambler, and he took it, and he let the boy live. When Spider Grandmother got the boy dressed up again and took him out of there, she told him that he cannot return anymore for what he has done. So the boy was taken back to where that hole was in, in, in the sky, and... His eagle was still there, and she put the boy on to his eagle's back, and he descended back down to his village. And when he descended, his family saw him coming back down. And yeah, that's basically the whole story of it, just the gist, because if I went into great detail, we're going to be here for a while. But yeah, that's the story from the Hopi side. Mm -hmm. I think when it comes to these stories, I think what was really crazy is that we both had this figure, but also just the location, right? Yes. Because in the Navajo story, he gets shot up into the sky, into the next world, into the stars. Wherever it lays beyond, it goes up, yako, yako. Because in the Navajo, in the, in the original Navajo telling of it, if you speak, say in Navajo, it just goes yako, which means upwards, up, up, yako. Because we call um the sky yatehish, and then beyond that is a place called yamosh. And so it says, it's just going yako, you went up yako, so it's like saying it's just going up. And so in the story of the Hopi, he, he's, he's in this, uh, what was it called again? From what I believe, this is the fifth world, but mm -hmm. I don't know if it's true or not, because we only believe that there are only four worlds, and we are in the fourth one right now. So I don't know if the story is true or not to its saying, or unless there was lost in detail when it was translated, but if possible, it could be the fifth world that you guys also mentioned in your stories too. Yeah, usually it can be seen as like the spirit world or the world where the spirits dwell because um, in the traditional Navajo belief system, Yamash is this place where our prayers go. So in, Nav in most Native American religions and cultures, we believe that one, that um, smoke carries our prayers. Shid. Shid carries our prayers up into the heavens to where, um, where, 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 our, where our, our prayers can reach the deities who live there. So in the place called Yamash, we say all the deities do all their in their physical form that they can be talked to and all that stuff, and that there's a uh they call it or uh I think like a white white house like a like a house made of white, and that's where we say that the supreme being lives in the Navajo way. You know, some could say it's God, some say it's the creator, but we I always heard it translated by my grandpa as my che as the uh, supreme being. That governs all everything in the universe that created the universe 
And we say a lot of other things are up there too, like the spirits of animals and the ancestors dwell up there too. As in this way, as as the Chitinet or wind people. And so in this way, we, we thought I thought it was really interesting that um Bichni, correct like he's up there too, because he got shot up there. And in the Hopi stories, it's similar. Even the presence of um of um spider grandmother. In the Navajo way we have a similar one we call Spider Woman, but it's still our grandmother. Na she na she so it's like, there's all these connections and all that. But I think at both stories, at the end of the day, at the core, the story of Chuckle, and then the story of um, the Hopi boy going into that world and, and betting against Gambler, is that you shouldn't really take these bets really crazy. Don't ever bet something that you can't win back on the line, you know? Keep it friendly and try not to get... Because that's the thing, gambling is a vice too. But you can still participate in it, but you can't go overboard with it. And that kind of ties to a lot of Native American cultures where we're just trying to find balance in the world. You know, there's really no real recognition of good and evil in the Western Christian sense, Judeo-Christian value sense. It's just a sense that there's chaos and peace, order and harmony versus like um, disorder and, you know, all that stuff. But we're just trying to find the balance between the two at the end of the day. You think that's well? Mm, no, nothing much really. Just it's kind of unique to like actually just to sit down to today and like really make some groundbreaking or find common ground to like of how I like our cultures are pretty similar to with, with not with Bithy and the gambler too on, on the Hopi side of the story but it's kind of interesting too on how like how just like it would be again like as, as Kenny mentioned too with with how like not with Bithy is like in is up there too or the stick got shot up in the stars too and like Whatever he's doing up there too, and as long and from your side of the story too, he's up in the fifth world too, wherever that may lie too, wherever that place is, beyond this world that we have, beyond this plane, and it's it's kind of it's just trying to find that balance too. Like again, as Kenny mentioned, you can have you can participate in some some and you can participate in the event too, but you can't just have to watch like what you what intentions you bring into the whole, into the whole like session, I guess, and do to put in a retrospect and also like to bet or you, you don't want to bet to something like you can't hold your end of the deal with, or you can't really pay up for too. Otherwise you'll be paying it for with something, something much more dear to you, like for a family member or something that's precious to you or even your life too, your own life, for example. And also to just, Find, find the perfect balance. As Kenny mentioned again too, you can't have, you can't have good without evil. You can't have evil without good. There's no, there's no. It's not one sided or the other. It's not, because if there's not, it's gonna, it's gonna become an imbalance. There's gonna be, there's gonna be disruption. There's gonna be breaking order. There's gonna be chaos. So you just have to find that well, that balance between the both of them too. But in my, in my recommendation, I would try to stay clear from any sort of gambling too that's just from looking at a more just like stable. a slot machine or anything like that yeah basically yeah, you know, yeah you don't just I don't know, in my recommendation you just have to like just stay away try to stay away from it as much as possible yeah because when you do start gambling you get that addiction in your mind seeing that you can win even though the odds are bet against you in any way my grandparents always said growing up that you don't gamble when you're young when you're still building your foundation when you get old, you can gamble because it's like you're old. So it's like you kind of had you had your your way to go, and you don't really have much to lose. You have disposable income. So growing up, they told me don't gamble until you're like at least sixty or seventy. You know, then you'll have disposable income. You'll have you'll be okay because it's like most people who gamble today are elders, but they have a fixed income, so they have money to spend. They have it, and when they're done, they have that wisdom and age to know. Okay, I'm done. They don't keep going. Compared to a young person who might be having. Uh, dreams of riches and fame and all that stuff. But that's the thing too. There's also like because there's a difference to be between main Western gambling and the old traditional Native American gambling. Because in the Navajo way, we used to have stick games. We played that during the winter, and there's other games that we play just for fun, just to gamble and all that. Sure, we play some bets, but it's nothing too crazy. It's usually just like food or something like that. Nothing like your home or your piece of land or your 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 your, your family members and all that stuff. And that's what it's basically saying. Don't ever let that addiction hold upon to you. But also, in the Navajo, mainly in the Navajo way, this is actually something that's not really found in much tribes. We appreciate 
freedom of self. The most, it's one of the most highest things. Even though our, we had leaders, they weren't like, they couldn't really tell you what to do. Your leaders were just there to support you and to uh, help you and provide for you. But a person's own like freedom of self was the most important. That's why we kind of live far from each other because we didn't want the burdens of society or like town life to keep us down. We wanted to be live our own lives. Uh, even like growing up, you could just write as a young Navajo person, you can just write away from your family to make your own way. And that wasn't looked down upon or seen as bad. Don't worry about you, but it's like at the end of the day, it's your life, right? It's your freedom of self. And that's what I think that story really taught us because it teaches us that we were slaves, enslaved peoples. And so when we wrote Rose Up, that taught us to never do that to any other people again. And um, I know a lot of like, some people say like in, in history classes, every people has like a record, has a record of slavery. But mm -hmm. for the Navajo, there was never like any large slave owning or anything like that. There was even slave, individual slave holding, you know? I always heard some stories that we would always, if we did capture people, we would either offer them to marry into the tribe or we give them supplies and tell them to go back. But it was mainly just like, the only reason why we used to steal people during raids was to, it was just an act of uh, warrior, like honor and like just to practice that. Just to practice, just to do it in a way because it was like a status symbol, like we can take your people. But we always offered them that chance for freedom, we didn't make them stay. And most of them did choose to live with the Navajo because it was a much more freer society, probably compared to like the more stricter hierarchical societies of like the Pueblo and Hopi, which, you know, they're very hierarchical. There's not that much like... You know, there's like uh, levels to their society and all that stuff. We're in the Navajo way. We're just kind of vibing our own. But then it happened like in reverse too and all that stuff. And I think that's what the story really tells. Like value your freedom. Chill out on the gambling. Don't go too crazy. And um, again, there's so many um, teachings and lessons that can be extrapolated from these stories. Because that, that's what these stories are here for. That's why they were, they were created or given to us by the holy people. Was that it was, their, it was them messing up. Our ancestors did a lot of mess ups. And we learn from the mistakes. That's ultimately the goal of these uh, stories that are taught to us. Even in like the Hopi story, you know, it talks about like it shows these aspects, explains these aspects of the world that are otherwise unknown to us as human beings in this physical realm. But yeah, so I guess that's like Nakwipikni. I guess like to gather all our all our talk together was just Nakwipikni was is just this like figure amongst southwestern tribes, namely the Navajo and Hopi. And that he was a gambler and his main goal is he tried to trick people into stealing their stuff. And when Monk for the Navajo, he got so bad that we were enslaved and we built Chaco Canyon along with other tribes. Well, in the Hopi way, he's kind of more, a more smaller being in the sense compared to the Navajo. Because to the Navajo, he was a very much a great threat that was like, it was about to like endanger the whole tribe. But in the Hopi way, um, the way you used to explain the story, it, he's not like much of a big threat. He's just kind of like this random trickster that shows up. But who knows, you know, there's probably more stories out there because you we only know so much between the three of us. There are probably more stories of the gambler, but some of them can be lost in time, too, that nobody knows about. Not even our elders know about either. Or they're um, hidden for the sake of ceremony or uh, cultural or, protection. Or they're hidden just so that some of these stories can also have been, uh, like uh, evil things of knowing how to release these certain beings back out into the yeah. world, which nobody wants that. It could be both, actually. Just it's hidden for it's either way. It's gonna be hidden for a reason. It's yeah. not really told as much as often for a reason, because also too like um, in our stories too, there are certain times in the seasons like we mentioned, like when we can tell our stories. Mm -hmm. For because <clears throat> we are in the springtime, we're in the springtime right now, and uh, right now certain stories cannot be told, and yeah, those stories can only be told in the winter time because a lot of our animals and a lot of the um, yeah, a lot of our animals and some of our deities too, that's their time to rest. That's their time to just, yeah, it's their time to rest and just not to be active yeah. as much. And so that's probably the reason why we're not really, we don't really know, into it. yeah, going deep into it, we don't really know much yeah. um, about about this this entity, this the Nakwi the yeah. gambler too, and I'm opposing too, that's possibly the same reason too on your guys' side too as well, or that it is hidden for a certain reason that, Whatever words that might be mentioned or like whatever whatever words that might be mentioned or spoken yeah. out of term too that might be like that trigger point, that trigger wound and that uh, whatever it is too it might just just bring be sprung up on us at some certain point. Like it'll come back and bite us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. That's why like in the story too, the main story that I was talking about, not who being there's there's mention of animals and certain deities that actually do help out, that play a major role. 
But I left that out because it's, they're up and about now. The animals are awake, so out of respect for the animals and their 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 stuff, we don't talk about them in the summer. But that's what I'm saying too. Like we can only really talk about it because it's kind of like um, a history too, because it's like the history when the Navajo during the 1100s when Chaco Canyon was being built. But if you want to take this from like a more scientific archaeological expect perspective, maybe take away all the supernatural elements. Maybe Nequibithni was one of the deities worshipped at Chaco. You know, one of the deities that a lot of the the Anasaz of the people there who worshipped it. You know, like maybe there was like a gambling god that they they that they worship, and then the Navajos, because with the Navajos in some stories of Chaco, they said that the Anasaza would belittle our holy peoples. So they would say to the Navajos, "Your gods are weak; they won't save you. They're not saving you. How can they? Um, how how can they? We're most powerful, and we even say that the people at Anasaza considered themselves gods in their own right because they could control the, the weather and all that, and they were building a grand civilization." But then the that deities of the holy people sprung into action and, and destroyed Chaco and freed us and along with the Navajo. So with certain things like that, you really get into controversial territory because you're making um, comments about a person's ancestry ancestry. Because some Pueblos do claim descendancy from Chaco or and they don't and they don't like it when Navajos talk about their ancestors in this in this light. But we don't really know the true truth, you know, we only know what we can get from archaeological records and oral histories. But that's why I always say, you know, it's kind of just good to have this conversation, get it open, so we can learn more about it and all that stuff. Like, I don't know, like, you you say, Mikhail, yeah, your village doesn't really descend from chocolate. It comes from here in the Flagstaff area, wasn't it? Um, I believe so, because there are at least um, three, maybe four different Hopi ruins here. There's Walnut Canyon, and there's also the um, ruins that are at the base of the peak on this side towards the north, which also is Hopi ruins, too. And there's the ones that are going down to Conwood or next to uh, the ghost town, uh, Jerome, yeah, which are right there, and including the ruins that are within uh, the uh, Sedona area also. Yeah. No, it's like a lot of, um. that's the thing too. It's like not all, tri like even like the Hopi, sure, you're all commonly connected, but each village has its own history, own rituals, own ceremonies, and own origin, you know? Mm -hmm. You guys happen to speak of Conwood. Same with Navajo clans. Like my people, then the Hobani, we claim that we um, some of us came from Pueblo, some of us came from. We were peaceful farmers for the longest time, but then you compare that to my second clan, not told that Tachini, and there were tobacco people living around the Grand Canyon area, around Shadow Mountain area, and there were tobacco farmers who lived in the canyons and who were warriors for the people. So it's like that, right? It's like different tribes, different things. So I had one side I was peaceful, one side I was warlike, and I think that's what most um, outsiders don't recognize is that all our clans, all our villages, kind of have their own versions of a lot of these stories because. A lot of them don't come from those places. So even then like that, if we wanted to get a, a, a true and um, perspective of Chaco, his, Chaco history from a descendant, we would have to find someone from someone from a Pueblo village or Hopi village who says that, who, whose village claims descendancy from Chaco. You know, stuff like yeah. that to get a better picture of what would have happened there. Because there was a reason why they migrated, but that, to them, that's their stories. You know, that's how they... That's how they, they keep it secret or whatever, you know. Some do tell about it. The uh, migrations Sometimes. and everything is just that we were told to travel the world. Yeah. We were told to journey until we found a place which we called home. There's a reason why all these all these ruins and of Hopi ruins and everything are abandoned because it wasn't the right place yet. Mm. Until we went out towards the what the U.S. government calls the Hopi Reservation. Yeah. But, yeah, just out there, that's where we found home and that's where we live to this day. And it's not going to change either. Yeah, like in the Navajo way, um, you can probably explain us about how like, the Four Sacred Mountains are the boundaries of our homeland. Yeah, so we have four sacred mountains. Well, six actually, but we have four main sacred mountains. They're mentioned in our stories. Or, um, their names are Sisna Jinnith, which is White Shell Mountain, Sol Zith, Turquoise Mountain, and um, uh, Dok Osli, <coughs> excuse me, Abalone Shell Mountain, and Dependence uh, Obsidian Mountain, and well, you probably it's probably known as like Blanca Peak for Sistan Jinnet and Mount Taylor, out in Grants for Salt Zith and um, San Francisco Peak for Dog Osteed and Big Sheep Mountain and um, for Dependent Top, and those four mountains lay out as a boundary for us for the Navajo people for the Dine people, there for. It's out in um, Alamosa in um, Colorado. And so it is based out in Grants, as I mentioned. And uh, Dok Osid is 
here in our here in Flagstaff and also our last mountain dependence high is based out in um along the La Plata Mountains out in Colorado again. So it forms like a little boundary for us for the Navajo people. To where to where it's like a within those boundaries we're like that's a place where a lot of us call it call it home. And that's it's always been like that too. It's always been carried along with us too and alongside too with the Navajo reservation that we have here based for us as well. But and looking at it in the traditional and looking back to our story since, but being within the four sacred mountains is that's where a lot of us now who is the that people call home. And of course too, that doesn't mean too that but it does give us it doesn't mean that we have to stay within those it's it, it doesn't mean excuse me, it doesn't mean that we need to stay within those boundaries. It just means that wherever you wherever you go in this life, wherever you go on your path, wherever path that you take, whether if you're yeah, if you if you when it's time to for you to make that journey into that from that young adolescence to to adulthood, wherever you go, wherever you may go, in, in this what path you take, whether if it's a job, your home, whether if it's outside of within the four sacred mountains, that gives you that knowledge that wherever you go, when you come back to the reservation, when you come back within the four sacred mountains, that place will forever be known as your home. That just means like you'll you'll never be homeless. You'll never be like lost. All you need to do is just go back to where you came from to recenter yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And it also doesn't really mean like that's exclusively Navajo territory either. It just means that that's like the extent of our where we should like expand our main cultural point and we should never expand beyond it. So in the same way, our homeland um, overlays with other homelands like the Paiute, Apache, and even like the Hopi and Pueblo. But we don't necessarily kick the Hopi off. We never told them to kick them off. Should we raid amongst each other? But we just lived amongst each other in that way. And again, it was a very much a clan village by village basis. That's the thing people got to realize. It, back then, the Navajo identity wasn't as necessarily solid as it is now. You didn't consider yourself really truly Navajo. You were like, I'm the Hobani, or I'm, um, I'm, I'm Totochini, I'm Kintochini. Same thing with each Hopi village. They wouldn't really say, I'm Hopi. Like, they would say, that's my ethnic group, my people, but I'm from this village, right? I'm from the village of Cooksmovi or Hope Villa or Oraibi. So it's like, um, that's the thing, right? It's like each village had different... Some villages like Navajo, some don't. Because mm-hmm. some villages were raided by Navajo, some villages actually had very um, close relations with Navajos. Um, there's even still, like, uh, you probably know about, like, um, Mikhail was telling me about this, like, some villages do, like, Navajo dances and all that, where they dress like Navajos to honor that. Yeah, um, during the fall time, uh, they would um, dance like either Apache, Navajo, um, and also our own tribe, which is Hopi too. And we dance these other Native American groups that are there, including uh, including um, Plains, like Comanche. Yeah, yeah, and all that, which is which I believe is to show respect to other tribes who are out there. Because when it comes to Apache, we wear headdresses that have these long red things going down. Which I believe they wear, but I don't know if they do or not. Yeah. Then for Navajos, I don't really know what we wear for that one. I think we just. I wear know it. the women wear the um, head bun, the one that we always wear, and the men too. No. They wear the. They don't wear the head bun. The guys don't. The guys don't. The women do though. I know yeah. they make it Navajo style, and they wear the sash belts Navajo style too. The ones I just seen, you know, here and there, what I heard from other Hopis and all that stuff. But I was talking to that one Hopi elder. He goes here to NAU a lot. What was his name? I always forget his name. Leroy? His name, first name was Leroy. Jenkins? <laughs> yeah, but um, he was talking about how, yeah, it was a way to show the Hopis, like, these are other peoples. Yeah. But also some villages, like, specifically, they had really, like, they were trading partners. I even heard a long time ago, too, and this was supported by Elder Stories, that some Navajos were actually, like, hired, in a way, by Hopi villages to live amongst them. So then, like, the Hopis would be living on the mesas and surrounded would be surrounded by Navajos. Because the Navajos were more warrior, warrior competent people because the Hopis were pacifists. And they were being attacked by people like the Comanche. And so they asked Navajos, mainly warrior clans of the Navajos, saying, hey, can you live amongst us? Um, we'll give you like food and all that in exchange for you to um, live amongst us and protect us from people like the Comanche. So that's the thing. It's very complex, very complicated. And I really don't like think that's the thing. It's kind of the problem with the Native American identities. Everyone thinks you can just simplify. Make it real easy, but it's never been that case. And if you're actually from the reservation, you live amongst them, us, you can even know that there's like regional differences from town to town, from agency to agency, from village to village, and all that stuff. And that's the thing. So you can't really oversimplify these things. And when it comes to Nukwe Beachley, 
I think the best part to go if we were to have a, like if there would be like a tribal consultation, is just get like people from all sorts of different um, groups and all that, and just have them tell their versions of that story. And then find where the common ground meets, because I think when we find that common ground, then we can know for sure that's the truth, right? Because mm-hmm. like for the Navajo, we can't know if Nakwipitni is really up. Like we both know, since we shared the stories and we compared them, that Nakwipitni is in this next world, the upper world, wherever you call it, fifth world, um, the spirits, spiritual world, the happy hunting grounds, whatever. He's up there, and that's where he's going to stay. But for the Navajo, we always see him as more of like a evil, not evil figure, but like a like an opposing figure to the Navajo way of life. On the Hopi, he's this trickster, and that and that same thing with a lot of other certain deities. Even there's like um certain deities that we share that we even pray to, um like um Scudney, the hunchback flute player for the Navajo, we pray to him, and that's similar to how do you say it in your in culture the flute player, Coco, Coco Bama? yeah yeah the ant one yeah yeah uh, that um. Uh, she represents more of a um, how would I put it um, um, lustful side yeah yeah because for us it's the god of the harvest and like uh, he brings rain so we do ceremonies to bring. he appears in one of the dances and all that so it's really interesting because it's like I know some villages have used to have um, Hopi villages used to have like a flute dance where they would use it to that. but like certain villages that's the thing but that's the thing we would need more Hopis because you're only from one village and um, you know we can't get, get too much into that, but yeah. So far, I mean, that was a pretty good, pretty good uh, story sharing session, you know. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, I say we call it right here for the end of this first episode. Yeah, about the gambler. Well, thank you for tuning in to the uh, Western Peak, and this is the end of the first episode. <laughs> <Is there laughs> <a> new song? <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, this is the end of the first episode, and I am glad to have two of my friends here. Introduce yourselves. I am Sahel James. And I'm Kenny Sloan. And this has been the Western Mountain Podcast. And make sure to go listen to some of our music that we send it out to on the Western Agency. Oh yeah, shout out to Western Agency. We're on Spotify and all that. And this was brought to you by Grishik Studios, which is an independent and digital Navajo owned um, recording studio. And I guess we'll catch you later. And and probably in the next podcast too, we'll talk about music and stuff and how uh, forms of and how uh, we int- interpret the music and, and all that into our lives. Hey. Okay, well, yeah. you guys have a good night. And this is Western Peak. Goodbye. <laughs>